Matthew 14, and we're up to chapter um, 14 now. We've had the section or the first section of parables. Um, I just, as we start today as a new chapter, we've been doing parables for quite a few weeks now. Can we just take a second and let's look at our, get a look at our bearings? Obviously, very central to the flow of Matthew is the formal and final rejection of Jesus and his Messiahship in chapter 12, which has led to a complete change in ministry. Jesus, who used to teach clearly Sermon on the Mount, is now preaching in parables publicly and only explaining them to his disciples privately. The miracles, which he did publicly to anyone and everyone as a sign to Israel, Israel's been told you'll have no more signs. And these miracles that are now going to be done will be done more privately to those who are disciples or at least those who have faith. And that's where we ended last time in that um, chapter 13 ended with there being no miracles or not many miracles in Nazareth, his hometown, because of their unbelief. So now we come to 14 and this first section of chapter 14, the first 12 or 13 verses, is really giving us an indication of where we're going. If you look a little bit further ahead... You'll see, and um, we'll do this next week, in verse 13, the, the well-known story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. If you go another couple of chapters ahead, oh, chapter ahead, you'll see Jesus feeding 4,000. So you have mass feeding, and then immediately after that, you have some miracles privately, or a miracle privately, and then going the other way, you've got Jesus doing mass feeding. And just before that, Jesus doing a miracle privately. And in the middle, we've got this crucial section, um, which in our Bibles has the heading, God's commandments, man's traditions. So that's kind of what we're building up to now. That beginning of chapter 15 is absolutely central because it's going to explain to us in more detail the reason for all this conflict, the reason why they rejected him, what is going on here, because that's then going to be expanded on moving forwards. The other thing that we have coming up, if you look to chapter 16, <clears throat> At the towards the end of 16, verse 21, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. So he's now about to begin speaking about his death and his resurrection. Look at verse 24. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And so along with the teaching concerning his death is the implication that we have to follow him to the cross, to death, if need be. So we have Jesus now the teaching has gone from, do you want a kingdom, to I'm going to die. Do you still want to follow me? That's kind of where we're going. And, and I say all of that as an introduction, because here in chapter 14, we're going to find the end of the story of John the Baptist. And as we've seen through this gospel, John the Baptist is the one who led the way for Jesus. He was the forerunner. He went before him. And so before we have Jesus in Matthew's gospel saying, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, we had John the Baptist before him saying, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Before Jesus said to the Pharisees, you're a brood of vipers, John the Baptist said to the Pharisees, you're a brood of vipers. John the Baptist was leading the way for Jesus. He was the herald for the king. And what we see in Matthew's Gospel is what happens to the herald, what the herald does, the same is going to be true for the king. And what do we have here? We have the death of John the Baptist, because that's what's going to happen to the king. So let's dig in then to chapter 14. 
You will find this to be a political passage. In Matthew's Gospel, we have a few political passages. If you're interested in taxation, we've got chapter 17 coming up. And also chapter 22, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and all of that. So there's a few politically charged passages, and this is certainly one of them. Remember the word politics we often associate with government, but there's all types of politics. There's the politics of government, but then you'll be aware that there are things like church politics. I think 90% of church splits that happen don't happen over doctrine or theology, but they happen over church politics, things like that. Petty squabbles. So this is going to be an important passage because it's, it's dealing with a lot of these political wranglings that go on. And um, there's much for us to learn here. So let's, let's dig in. At that time, so the time that's being referenced is the time, if you're going to be very specific, when Jesus is rejected in his hometown. But I think more broadly what Matthew is saying is it's the time of the rejection of Jesus. The offer of the kingdom has happened. The offer of the kingdom has been rejected. And Jesus has now changed his ministry. And although it's already happened, now we're going to focus on the death of John the Baptist because that's the direction that we're going in. So it's at that time of rejection that Herod the Tetrarch heard the news about Jesus. Now, the news contextually is him doing those miracles. Though the miracles are now more private, obviously he's been doing them publicly. <clears throat> and so it is that obviously people have heard. And Herod says, this is John the Baptist. He has risen from the dead. And that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. For when Herod had John arrested, he bound him and put him in prison. Okay, let's leave it there for a moment. So the context to the story of the death of John the Baptist is not John the Baptist dying. John the Baptist has already died, but we haven't been told yet. We're being told now because it's, as I've shown you, relevant to the flow of Matthew's Gospel. Okay? The context for this story of his death coming up is that the miracles of Jesus are being done, and Herod's saying, well... How on earth is that happening? Maybe this is John the Baptist, he's risen from the dead. Because paranoia runs deep in that family, as we shall see. <clears throat> but for us to understand what's going on, we're going to have to have a little bit of, <clears throat> well, I was going to say history, but that makes it sound boring. So let's call it a little bit of reality TV, okay? Because that might perk you up a little bit. R reality TV is famous today for salacious relationships and, you know, all of this kind of scandal and corruption and, you know, oh, is so-and-so going to sleep with so-and-so and, you know, are these couples staying together? This is the reality TV, as it were, of that day. Let me give you the background. You know the name Herod because there was Herod killing the innocents at the beginning of Matthew's Gospel. Different Herod. They're not the same person. So let's, let's call them by their names so we kind of uh, get our delineation. The first Herod, who killed all those children because of his paranoia of there being a king of Israel, was one that we will call Herod the Great. Now, Herod the Great, um, he was a ruler on behalf of the Romans, and he married... Um, Many people. <laughs> he had several wives over time. And he had many sons. And uh, his favorite wife was a wife called Marianne. And Marianne gave him a son um, called Aristobulus. Don't have to remember that. No one's going to quiz you later, but that's just what he was called. And Aristobulus had a daughter called Herodias. So Herodias, who's in our story today, is the granddaughter of Herod the Great, who killed all the offspring. Now, as we know from, from that early part of Matthew, he was a paranoid man. And in his paranoia, his fear of thinking that there was going to be a, some king of Israel that would conquer him and remove him, which of course, if people of Israel had accepted Jesus, would have happened. Um, he killed all those innocent children. He also killed Marianne, his favorite wife. 
He also killed Aristobulus, his son, because he thought that they might try to take his position as well. So he was, he was a paranoid man. Now, this, this um, uh, Herod is not, um, is not Herod the Great. It's, it's another one of his sons. He is called Herod Antipas. So if you've got Herod the Great, Herod Antipas. This is Herod Antipas. He is the son of the Herod that killed the babies. Okay? Now, he was a nominal convert to Judaism. In other words, because he's ruling over Israel, he's trying to you know, make sure he's friendly with the people, the people like him. And again, this is politics, right? Your politicians, our politicians, those who represent us, right? It's a case of, um, well, I want these people to like me, so let me say I'm going to do this. You know, whether it's forgive student loans or, you know, whatever else. Let's say these things. We've got an election coming up. Let's say some things. Um, tax the rich, you know, capital gains on unrealized you know, profits. You know, let's say things because elections are coming up. So in that kind of vein, Herod Antipas, like his father before him, becomes a nominal convert to Judaism. Which, why they used to say it was safer to be one of Herod's pigs than to be his wife. Because he wouldn't kill pigs, because he was a nominal Jew. But he killed a few wives and a few kids, as you do. So, Herod, Herod Antipas was also a convert to Judaism, at least nominally. And he was also a little bit on the paranoid side. So, as we've seen, Herodias who is uh, here. Let's have a look at verse 3. Herod, this is Antipas now, had John arrested. He bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias. And notice what she is called. She's called the wife of his brother Philip. Now, this is important. Okay? Try and follow this. It's hard. Okay? This is a tangled web that makes, you know the real housewives of whoever seem like, you know, easy to follow. All right? This is what, this is what happened, okay? So Herodias, as we've seen, is the granddaughter of Herod the Great, okay? She marries Philip. There you go. Here's Philip. Philip's the brother of Herod Antipas. So she marries Philip, and he's another son of Herod the Great. So she's married her half uncle. Follow this. She's married her first uncle. She leaves him, which may be common if you're a real housewife somewhere in America, but is not common in that day and age. She leaves her husband while he's still alive, and she becomes the mistress of her step-uncle. And then eventually, she leaves the step-uncle And she marries Herod Antipas. So at this time, she is legally married to Herod Antipas. What is she described as in the biblical text? The wife of his brother, Philip. Why doesn't it say she's the wife of Herod Antipas? Because Philip's still alive. She just left one husband, became a mistress of somebody else, both uncles, half uncle, step uncle, and now has got married to Herod Antipas, even though she's still married to Philip. So if you're keeping count, we have two cases of, we've got one case of bigamy, two cases of incest, and three cases of adultery. That's Herodias. Isn't that astonishing? What a tangled mess. Now, there's going to be things here that are relevant moving ahead. There's going to be things relevant to marriage and divorce when we get to chapter 18. There's going to be um, other things that come out from this as well. But what we need to understand now is that Herodias is somebody who has a checkered past and is basically has married Her- um, Herod Antipas, this, this Herod of this scene, even though she was still married to his brother. So, it's a little bit of a mess. Now, this is where it, you know, so again, the details are interesting. 
I will probably forget them by tonight. If you say to me, hey, Anthony, who was married to... I will probably forget by tonight. I use, don't use many notes, but I have more than normal today. So don't worry. Just remember, bigamy, one. Incest, two. Adultery, three. If you can remember one, two, three, you know how bad the situation is. But verse four is where it really starts to impact us. Okay? <clears throat> Now, the reason for his paranoia is because, you know, oh my gosh, this, these miracles, maybe this Jesus guy is just John the Baptist risen from the dead. Why is he paranoid? Because he had John killed. Why did he have John killed? Everything you need to know is in verse 4. Now, it's because of Herodias, but look at 4. John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Now, this is, this is an intriguing verse and it's an important verse. There has been much talk in the last year, especially, about something that is called Christian nationalism. Now, it is one of those terms that is grossly unhelpful, in my opinion, because... When you say Christian nationalism, person A thinks you're thinking about one thing and person B thinks you're thinking about another thing. And so unless you define your terms, you can have two people saying, this is good and this is bad, and actually they believe the same thing. So it gets a little confusing. So I don't like to use that term. I'd rather just talk generally without using terminology. But what we're looking at here is how Christianity impacts Government, politics, even amongst those who don't believe. John the Baptist has said to Herod, it's not lawful for you. He's not referring to Roman law. He's not referring to 21st century American law. He's not referring to mid middle-aged you know, um, British law in the Middle Ages. Or, or Armenian law of the ninth century, or you know, I don't know, the laws of African tribes in in the you know the 1800s or something. You know, he's referring to the law of God, and he says to a man, he says, "Hey, you can't do this because it's not lawful." Now, we could, we have to take a step back and say, we understand that Herod Antipas was a nominal convert. So he's kind of saying, well, yeah, I'm kind of, I'm kind of a, of a Jew. And so some would say, well, he's obliged because he's called himself a Jew. Well, Biden calls himself a Catholic. I don't, I'm not convinced that the nominal faith is the key factor here. I think what we need to understand is this. John the Baptist, a prophet of God, speaks to the number one ruler and says to him, I mean, okay, he's not the emperor of Rome, but he's the ruler of the region, the Tetrarch. He's in charge of everything happening in Judea. And he says to him, your personal behavior is out of line. You can't do this. Man, we need more people like that today. We're entering a time when we need to start being willing to do that. And, and I mentioned the whole Christian nationalism debate because a lot of it boils down to this. Well, look, as Christians, we should be changing the world by preaching the gospel and as we preach the gospel, people are converted and lives are changed and then the world changes. But sometimes people will say, but what we shouldn't be doing is trying to change the world by telling people who don't believe you can't do this and you can't do that. i sorry, I disagree with that. Paul says in Romans 1 that everybody knows and is without excuse that there is a God and that he is sovereign. He is powerful. How do they know that? Because they live in this created world that he created for them. They have life that he gave to them. So everybody, Romans 1, is without excuse. Therefore, 
Everybody is obliged to worship the God who created them. Hey, guy on the street who is, you know, sleeping around, you're a sinner and that sin will send you to hell. There's nothing wrong with saying that. I'm not suggesting that we all take soapboxes and stand on the street corner and do that. But what I'm saying is it's not wrong for us to take people who don't, who say, I don't believe in God, and say to them, you're a sinner. That's not wrong. That's biblical. And I don't understand why this is even remotely controversial, but politicians don't get an out on that. Right? Just because somebody is in a political office doesn't mean, well, I'll say to this guy I don't know, you're a sinner and you should repent, and what you're doing is wrong, but I won't say it to a politician. I won't say it to a ruler. I won't say it to a celebrity. What nonsense! When people say and do things publicly, it demands a public response. And we need to say, that's not okay. That's wrong. That's sinful. You shouldn't do that. That's not okay. And there are so many things in this country going on that are happening through legal or semi-legal means that are being politicized. And they're just wrong. It's not complex. You just look at the Bible and you say, well, that's wrong. Because God gets to define good and God gets to define evil. And if there is, if, 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 if somebody has a definition of Christian nationalism that says rulers need to be under the, you know, political rulers need to be under the sovereign, are under the sovereign rule of Christ, are given their authority by him and they need to do what he says, then I'm all for that. Very much for it. These people need to repent. They need to do as they're told by Jesus. He said, we don't believe in Jesus. It doesn't matter. He's still the king. Right? If a police officer pulls you over, right, and says to you, excuse me, sir, excuse me, sir, you were just doing 100 on the freeway. Can you show me your license and what have you? And you turn around and say, Oh, that's a good costume. Where'd you get that from? You're not, you're not a police officer, are you? Oh, that's funny. Who set you up? Was, was it, was it someone, my friend someone said they set you up? Oh, you know, you're not really a police officer. You can play that game all you like. You can be utterly convinced that they're not a real police officer. But you're going to get arrested. Because they have authority whether you believe it or not. Jesus is Lord. Right? He is sovereign over all. I don't know building wise where we're going to end up, but I would love to some, wherever we are long term, to have just Jesus is Lord written in the largest letters possible in the most visible spot possible. Because we just need to say to the world, you know what? Jesus is in charge. He's Lord. He's boss. He's sovereign. He is everything. And therefore, when Jesus says, do this and don't do that, then you are lawfully obliged to do the things he says and to not do the things he says not to do, just as much as we are obliged to keep any laws of this country. In fact, more so. So I... I, I am the, I'm the first person that says the way that we change this world is spiritually through preaching the gospel. But I don't see <clears throat> that we then have to draw a line <clears throat> and somehow support religious pluralism. Right? And, and I, I don't want to get into a big sermon on Christian nationalism generally, but I do want to say this. The people whose view I do oppose are those people who somehow say... You know what? It's the role of government is to give us a freedom of religion and this free society. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. The government is not obliged to build more mosques. Okay? It's not. Shall I tell you how I know that? Because the Bible says that worshipping other gods is evil. It's wrong. And woe to those who call good evil and evil good. 
It is not the job of the government to facilitate the worship of false gods. You say, well, but you're imposing Christianity upon people then. I guess. I'm all right with that. I'm not telling people they have to be converted. I'm not asking government to do the job of the church. I'm not saying the government should preach the gospel. But what I'm saying is the government was given authority to punish evil and reward good. And to go out and say, well, all religions are equal, they're all fine, and, and we should be encouraging government to treat, to treat everyone the same, regardless of religion and, and you know, multicultural or multipluristic, whatever society, blah, 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 blah. That's just not biblical. Hey, you know what? It's wrong to leave your husband, who was your uncle, and go and get married to somebody else who's also in the family, and, you know, that's just wrong, right? It's also wrong to worship other gods. It's also wrong to live this lifestyle. And government's duty is to punish evil. So I think part of the problem here is that we have become so comfortable with statism that we don't even see that it's idolatry anymore. That we've allowed government to have so much power and authority that we don't see the, the, the giving government the right to set rules and to do this and to do that, that, that somehow we're giving them power, we're giving them like a godlike power that, 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 that they're not entitled to. Their only authority was given to them by God, and God gave them that authority to punish evil. Now, there are all sorts of implications of that. I know a book that might help you. Um, and we'll talk about it more when we come to Matthew 17, when we're dealing with taxation. Matthew 22, um, render unto Caesar as well. We'll deal with these issues more. But I do want to say this very clearly from verse 4. John the Baptist died because he told Herod he was a sinner and needed to repent. That's why. And so often, things are given political reasons that are really just personal. There was a lot of talk during COVID that one of the reasons that the California government went so hard on Grace Community Church, while there were plenty of other churches that were open, the reason that they legally went so hard on them is that you can look back and you can see some conversations on Larry King. Um, some clips from Larry King where John MacArthur and then, I think he was mayor of San Francisco at the time, um, Gavin Newsom, went head to head on certain issues. And there may have been some bad blood. Do you know, maybe one day I'll say something about Gavin Newsom and I'll end up dead. That's not a bad way to go. John the Baptist did it. But you see, here's the problem. You know, just taking a step back from this as a whole. Because I'm guessing that most of you won't die from saying something negative about a politician. Okay? But we know for a fact that FBI and others, this isn't conspiracy theory, this has been admitted to, are gathering details on people who do things like, are into stuff to do with Bibles, and if you like guns, then you're definitely going to be on a watch list, you know. And they're keeping an eye on people. There are people who, because of their politics, have lost their bank accounts. Guys, this is just the beginning. If you stand up for Christ, and I don't mean you say, yes, I'm a Christian. What I mean is that you're prepared to allow your faith to impact you saying, this is right and this is wrong. If you live that life, you may lose your right to bank. You may lose your right to have the job that you have. And what I think was so wonderful about COVID and that whole era was it showed us who had the courage to say, you know what, I'm not going to do that. No, I'm not going to agree to this. No, I'm not going to play along with you. Because quite frankly, too many of us were too willing, and I include myself at the beginning, too willing not to stand up. And I think that what is clear here is that John the Baptist, he says to religious leaders, the most respected spiritual people of that day, you brood of vipers. 
And he says to Herod, who's the greatest political leader of that day, he says, you're a sinner and you need to repent. And he doesn't hold back. Are you prepared to do that? Are you prepared to say things publicly that might get you cancelled, blocked, might cost you financially? Because I did tell you where we're going, right? I told you we're going to chapter 16. Deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me, lose your life so that you might gain it. Don't hold on to your life or you'll lose it. That's where we're going with this. And you, if you're alive today, have grown up in an era that was more welcoming of Christianity. You've grown up, those of you who are older, in in environments where being a Christian was an incredibly positive thing societally. We are going into an era where being a Christian is the most negative thing societally. We're going into an era where if you hold to the views of Jesus, you could lose your job, you can lose your financing, you can lose all sorts of things. There are... There are, there are companies out there that are multi-trillion dollar companies that everybody is borrowing from to keep their businesses alive. So if you have a multi-billion dollar business selling computers or makeup or whatever else, you are the debtor, you are beholden to these big corporations that you're borrowing from. And they're saying, we want, we want DEI. We want you to say some, you know, this is how the whole Bud Light thing happened. You, you need to be seen to be more positive about this. Why would they do something when it's such bad business? Because they're, they're relying on those they borrowed from and telling them to do so. You, you guys, you need to understand, you are going to be the hated people in this next generation. If you hold to biblical views. And why I'm preaching this so hard is this. Some of you want to shut your mouths, put your head in the sand, and keep out of trouble. How do you read the Bible and think that that's acceptable? It's not. You need to stand up and be counted for Christ. You say, well, I don't want to get into fights about, about this and about that moral issue. I mean, I, I believe the Bible's true, but I don't want to get into squabbles about it. And it's like, that's very, very close to, to being ashamed of what Jesus taught. If the Bible teaches something, please don't think that that's something that, oh, yeah, well, it says that and I kind of believe that, yeah, but I don't really want to talk about it because, you know, you know, it's controversial. You you can't be doing that. Did John the Baptist do that? But I think the other thing is this. Some of you have been emboldened. I know who you are. You've come out from this last few years and you are much more bold than you were in 2019. You have been matured through the fire. You've come out and said, do you know... I'm going to be tougher, I'm going to be stronger, I'm not going to back down, I'm going to speak out. Good on you. I'm just here to tell you that someone's going to want your head on a platter. Somebody's going to want to kill you. And are you prepared to do that? Let's let's look at what we know about John the Baptist. He was prophesied in Scripture... He was the forerunner, the herald, announcing Christ, the Messiah, coming. He spoke out against religious authorities and they hated him. He spoke out against political authorities and they hated him. He ends up in prison. He doesn't see the kingdom that he was forerunning and heralding and announcing coming into being. And so he asks, is this right? And he's there in a jail cell, questioning everything that he's done. And then he ends up being beheaded because someone has a grudge against him. And Jesus says, this is the greatest one. (laughs) 
Do you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven? Does, does it remind you of that story when the mother of James and John come to Jesus and say, Hey, in the kingdom, I want my sons to have the best seats. Jesus says, you've got, you've got no idea what you're asking. Can, can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink from? Do you understand that the greatest saints are the ones who suffer the most? You see, when we come to chapter 14 in this journey, we've now gone from, here is a kingdom, just, just repent, turn, and here is a kingdom. This is going to be glorious. Come into the kingdom. And now everything has shifted. And now it's a case of, you want to be great? You ready to die? And some of you haven't yet decided if you want to be comfortable or if you're prepared to suffer. Some of you haven't yet decided if you want to be a lukewarm Christian that keeps their head down and avoids the gunfire or if they're going to be standing up and proclaiming. Some of you haven't decided yet. John the Baptist said, it's not lawful for you to have her. <clears throat> There's some stuff I've got to teach later in Matthew's Gospel. I'm going to remind myself of this first. Because there's stuff that we say, because Scripture says it, and it doesn't make us popular. My job, my only job, is to just teach what Scripture teaches, to be faithful to it. But that's true for all of you to some degree. You're disciples of Christ. You're there to represent him. You're there to reflect him. Are you prepared to die for him? That's a question that we're going to have to ask ourselves again and again as we go through Matthew's gospel from this point. Now, Herod, Herod wanted, verse 5, to put him to death. <clears throat> he wanted to put him to death. So it's not as if he's being asked to do this and he doesn't want it. He, he wants to put him to death. But the reason that John wasn't already dead was because he feared the crowd because they were regarding John as a prophet. In, in other words, <clears throat> he personally wants him dead, but it won't look good to the masses who he has to appease. This, my friends, is politics. And you are involved in politics. And I don't mean you just who you're voting for in November. You are involved in politics if you go to an office. Work politics. There's church politics. Wherever there's a group of people, there's politics, right? And what happens is, People don't do what they're supposed to do, what they want to do, because of concerns about how people are going to react and respond. Now listen, I'm not asking you to be a knucklehead, right? I'm not asking you to be that person who goes places and you don't care about what anybody thinks, right? Because that's thoughtless and not compassionate, right? And we're supposed to be caring and compassionate and kind, right? So I'm not saying, ah, oh, I don't care what so-and-so says, just go and say whatever. That's, that's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is this. <clears throat> I'm not suggesting Herod should have killed John early just because he wanted to. But what I'm saying is the way group politics work is that people don't do things, in this case it's a bad thing, but in our case we don't do things that we should do because it's awkward. Because people won't like us. Because, you know, it'll cause a kerfuffle. Sometimes causing kerfuffles saves having much, much, much bigger kerfuffles. I've been a pastor for over 20 years. I've seen multiple church splits. I've seen them from close up and I've seen them from afar. And in almost every situation, almost every time, there are things that if they were just dealt with sooner, would never have happened. Well, what happens is people don't want to cause a little kerfuffle. They don't, they don't 
express themselves. They don't communicate. And then what happens is it just builds up and it builds up and it builds up and then boom. And you see it in churches, you see it in businesses, and you see it in families and in marriages. All because people are afraid of other people's reactions. Do you know what is the most empowering thing? Is when you go through life and you love and you care for those around you, but you don't care what they think about you. That is such a powerful combination. There are lots of people out there who are so fearful of what everybody else thinks about them. And there's lots of people out there who don't really care about anybody but themselves. But if you can be someone who prefers, prioritizes, cares for, loves, serves other people, and at the same time, because you love them, in the act of loving them, you're not concerned about how they react, you are in a powerful position. Paul says that leaven spreads through the loaf. And in that context, he's talking about sin and false doctrine spreading through the body of Christ. We have an obligation to confront one another over our sins. But that's a kerfuffle, is it not? We don't want to have to do that, do we really? Should we just leave that for the pastor? That's not what the Bible teaches us. And sometimes because we're a smaller church, people think that that's my job. Can you imagine in a larger church, pastors trying to keep track of everybody's sins? I don't, I don't even know in this church know what most of you get up to most of the time. Nor do I want to. I am not the Holy Spirit. His job is not up for, for, you know, for bidding. And I'm not trying to take his job. It is his job to oversee your life and convict you of sin. But when sin, when we become aware of sin within the body, we have to address it. And when things are done that are sinful in the world, it's good and right for us to speak out about it. Now, some people are more vocal than others. Some of you, what have you. But don't be that person that doesn't share your view. Don't be that person that doesn't just avoids conflict at all costs. Guys, you're a Christian. Christ died for you. And we are called to die for him. And some of us are more concerned about living a comfortable, cozy American dream than we are about living and dying for Christ. Herod wanted him to death, but he feared the crowd. Well, in this case, it worked out for good because he shouldn't have killed him at that time. But it does illustrate for us how people think. Be someone who cares and loves those around you, but doesn't care what they think if you're doing the right thing. We have an audience of one. It is only God that we should be trying to please. Verse 6. When Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Now, because this girl is referred to as the daughter of Herodias and not Herod, she's already had one husband, she's already been a mistress, and now she's with Herod. So clearly this daughter's a bit older. This is, this is not um, toddlers in tiaras, okay? This is... This is uh, most likely a a physically adult, perhaps teenager, maybe older, we don't know. But the implication here is that this is some kind of dancing that maybe you'd see in certain clubs, but you shouldn't be seeing in church. Should we leave it at that? And this is the, his stepdaughter. This is a sordid, sordid thing. And he was pleased with what he saw. And he was so pleased that he gives an oath. He promises an oath to give whatever she asked. Man, there's, there's, there's so much here, isn't there? 
this is one of uh, this is one of those things in the Bible that comes up in the Old Testament and the New Testament that we need to learn from. Don't promise things you can't follow through on. Whenever Jed and I watch TV and we watch some of those British cop shows, best detective shows on the planet are the British ones, just so you know. And uh, and the, 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 the detective will say to, you know, somebody's mourning a loss, and the detective will say, we'll catch them. I promise you. And Jen will say, he shouldn't say that. <laughs> he shouldn't say that. And he shouldn't say that, because he can't promise. He doesn't know. He doesn't know if they're going to find the killer or not. And sometimes when people are under pressure to find the killer, they end up finding someone and calling them the killer when they're not the killer. But that's another whole thing. But... But there's this kind of, oh, I promise I'm going to do this. Listen, I think as Christians, there's something that we understand, we should understand. And that's the value and the importance and the weight of covenant. Christ says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He will never leave us nor forsake us. He is a covenant-keeping God and his loving kindness endures forever. That's the refrain of the Psalms, isn't it? His loving kindness endures forever. His loving kindness endures forever. His loving kindness. And, and in the Old Testament, the concept of love, covenant love, and covenant faithfulness or truth go hand in hand. Because what happens is, this is why love and truth go together. This is why in the New Testament, grace and truth go together. Because God, in his love, in his grace, in his choice, says, I will do this, and he's going to do it. That's how we're called to be. And, and that's why when I do premarital counselling, I say to people, I'm not going to marry you unless you believe in the vows that you're going to make. The vows say, for better or worse, till death do us part. Can you think of things that are bad or worse or horrific that might cause you to end your marriage before death. If you do, don't say those vows because you don't mean them. And if you won't say those vows, I won't marry you. I want no part in it. You see, this is the reality here, folks, is that words matter. Promises count. And Herod... And remember, we've just been told in the previous verse, he's very concerned what the people around him think of him. He says, oh, I promise, this is wonderful, I promise, I'll give you whatever you ask. Dumb, dumb, dumb. But we need to be careful that we don't make promises, commitments, and oaths that we might not be able to fulfill. Your words are important. Your words should be trusted. And so it is that he says to her, you can have whatever you want. Now, having been prompted by her mother, this is Herodias, the mother, <coughs> she said, give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. Herod wanted John the Baptist dead. Because John the Baptist said to Herod, it's not lawful, you can't have her. And here in the background is the wife he's not supposed to have, and she's offended too. I don't know how to word this carefully, so I just probably won't word it carefully. Um, 20 years of church experience, you can upset a man in the church and his wife's reaction can impact the entire future of the church. And, and I'm sorry, I've seen it too many times, I would literally run out of fingers trying to count them. It happens. And I think that, you know, it's not to suggest that this is, this is um, you, know, you know, women are terrible and women are like this and what have you, 
But, you know, expressions like a woman scorned, they come into common usage for a reason. And if you're one of those women, you're probably offended at me right now for saying it. But, but the reality is this, is that men and women are different. We're not supposed to be the same. And, and women are created by God to be nurturers. You come between a mama bear and her kids, ooh, it gets nasty, right? That's how it's supposed to be. Gosh, look at me, I'm preaching a Mother's Day sermon without even realising it. God's providential timing. But, but mothers, mothers will go, go to war for their kids. There's this nurturing. And, and, and wives are, are there biblically to be helpmeets for their husbands. And there is a protected element around them. And that is a good and wonderful thing when it doesn't become sin. And there's Herod, and you, you can't, you know, John the Baptist saying, Herod, you can't have her. And there she is behind the scenes, seething that her husband would be called out. There she is behind the scenes, seething that she would be publicly embarrassed. And she's waiting for this opportunity. And if there's, if there's applications that apply to you, may the Holy Spirit do that job, because I've probably said too much already that might cause me to get into trouble. So, give me on a platter the head of John the Baptist. There's no, there's no sort of, well, we'd like to have him killed. She wants the head served on a plate. There, we had in Matthew 5, the whole uh, Sermon on the Mount, you know, if you call someone raka, fool, then it's hate, and hate is murder. There's that whole kind of progression. This is a woman whose hatred is so seething, her anger is so boiling, that she literally wants to see the head on a platter, served up like a dish. Show me his head. You imagine hating someone that much. No wonder John the Baptist called him to repent. And although he was grieved, notice this, he's grieved. Is he grieved because he doesn't want John to die? No, we were told a few verses earlier, he does want John to die. He's grieved because he knows that the death of John the Baptist will not paint him in a good light before the people he wants to be loved by. That's why he's grieved. Man, I told you there's a lot about politics and interpersonal relationships in this passage. When you're upset with someone, and I guess we're kind of getting into the whole marital counselling realm here. When you're upset with someone, it's normally because of how you've been made to feel, how you are thought of. One of the most amazing things about the transforming work of the Holy Spirit is that we can become more grieved at sin than we are about people not liking us, than we are about being treated badly, than we are about being spoken out against. If we could just be grieved over sin more than being taken down a peg or two, my goodness, that would save so many marriages. That would save so many relationships. That would save friendships. That would save churches. That would make such a difference if you were just more bothered about sin than you were about what people think about you. And he's grieved because he's going to look bad, because people won't like him. And this is why in Matthew 5, we were told in the Beatitudes that this is what a repentant person looks like. It's blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Mourn over sin, folks. Don't mourn over people not liking you because of your actions. So though he was grieved, the king commanded it to be, to be given because of his oaths and because of his dinner guests. And here we are again. It's what other people think of him. It's not being made to look stupid in public. I am constantly reminded as a pastor, one of my most important jobs is to admit when I'm wrong. I've been involved in churches for 40 years and the amount of times that I've come across church leaders who it 
like the impossible thing, the one thing they couldn't do was admit they were wrong. Now, sometimes we're going to disagree. People are now are probably thinking, yeah, I know you're wrong, and you haven't, told, you haven't admitted to me you're wrong. It's like, yeah, sometimes we disagree. But what's so important is that within our hearts, we have to be open to being wrong, and when we are, we can say, I was wrong. It's just so important. No matter, the more authority, the more, the, more, the more responsibility you have in life, the more important this is. And Herod could have got out of his oath. This is not something that the Pharisees and Pharisaic Judaism prevented him. The, I, I read a whole thing, and I won't bore you with it, and I couldn't repeat it if I tried, to be honest. But I read through Pharisaic law, the work I do for you, you're welcome. I read through Pharisaic law, basically saying, when you make an oath, you have to do this, and you can't do that, and what have you. And, and the, the short version is this. He could have got out of his oath. He didn't get out of his oath because the immediate shame in front of his dinner guests was greater for him than the later bigger shame in front of the nation as a whole because he's killed John the Baptist. He's literally weighing things up. I've said this before in the context of Romans 6. That sometimes you see people turn their lives around and they stop doing this sin and they're not Christians. And you're like, well, how have they conquered that sin? And it's like they just exchange one sin for another. They desire the six pack more than they desire the pint of ice cream. They, you know, they, they're just exchanging sins. John the Bat, um, Herod here is just weighing things up. And for so many of us, the immediate pressure. The short-termism is often the determining thing. He's just like, well, I got these dinner guests here, I'm going to look stupid. And so he goes ahead. What a weak and pathetic man. He sent, he had John beheaded in the prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl. This is crucial. And she brought it to her mother. The woman who hated got her wish. She got to see And in that moment, I'm sure she was deeply satisfied. In that moment, I'm sure that um, it felt good. Ah, got him. He didn't win. And yet Jesus says that John the Baptist is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Salome, the girl, she, she ended up marrying an uncle as well. Seems to run in the family, this stuff. She was widowed very early and she died young of a nasty disease. And guessing the nature of what we've spoken about today, you can guess the type of disease it was. These people didn't win. The people out there causing wars for share prices, the people out there who are winning, the people out there who are who are imposing restrictions on us in governmental power while they get to live how they wish. The people who have one rule for them and one for the little people like us, they may be winning in the world's terms, but they will not win. Do you understand that? Do you understand that if you stand up for Jesus Christ and someone puts your head on a platter tomorrow, that you have the entirety of eternity that you will be rewarded for the stance that you took that put your head on the platter? And those who put your head on the platter, they will spend eternity with weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the decision we're going to have to make. And as we go through Matthew's Gospel from this part point forwards, as we get into chapter 16, as we start to see the tales of, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, and then we see the death of Christ, we will be reminded again and again and again, what about us? In chapter 14, passage this morning, is the passage that leads us into this next section of the gospel. Who are you? How much courage do you have? Men, are you weak like Herod? Do you make bad decisions on the basis of those around you? Women, 
Do you allow yourself to become embittered because people haven't said the right things to you? Do you like to cause discord and turmoil? Or are we going to be the kind of people that hate sin, especially our own, love people around us, but don't care what they think of us, as long as our God will say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for this passage of scripture. May it challenge and may it convict us. May we hate our sin. May we speak boldly for Christ. May we call on those in this world to turn and to repent. Because we love them. May we speak words of truth. May we not allow politics, wherever that may be, in whatever circle or group of people, may we not allow those kind of things to impact us, to impact what we do and what we say. But may truth be always our desire. And may we seek your glory and not our own. May we seek you being adored and not our own adoration. May we seek your glory above all things. Amen.